welcome to my backyard, more specifically, my garage. Now, Megan and I moved into this house in January, so it's been nine months. We redid a bathroom, we redid uh, some electrical, all of the house's plumbing. It's been a lot. Uh, and Well, look, we even made parts of it smart. But we ended up with this little space in our garage that was uh, unused. It was a little workshop that was gross and dirty. And my wife and I thought, well, hey, hold on a minute. We're pretty good at doing stuff. Why don't we turn it into a gym? She's very fitness oriented, as you can tell by my physique. I pretty much never have been, but my metabolism is slowing down. It's been doing that for years. I wake up and my back hurts. I need to be more fitness oriented. And so, yeah, we built a gym. It's small and we did it ourselves, so it's not perfect, but we're pretty happy with it. We uh, took the room down to the studs. We redid all of the insulation and electrical. We installed the drywall. Uh, we painted it together. We uh, did all of the moldings, the crown and, and the baseboards are installed. I installed the floor a couple days ago. I've got to go through, sand some stuff down, uh, paint. Oh, we put in a brick wall. That was fun. And uh, yeah, it, it looks great, but look, it's just a room. And uh, we didn't want a room, we wanted a gym. So now we're going to turn this room into something smart, a smart gym. But before we do anything inside, we gotta start outside. This building is detached from my house and therefore it doesn't have ethernet. Now, the obvious solution is just Wi-Fi, duh. I went out and bought a couple access points, especially ones that were rated for outdoor usage. I pointed them at the garage and while most stuff worked, like my phone and my laptop, not everything did. Because as we know, not all Wi-Fi devices are created equal. Specifically, my car and some smart home devices that I got either wouldn't connect at all or they'd connect but then disconnect and weather screwed stuff up. It was just a mess. So the easiest, most robust solution is, well, just dig up some of your lawn, put some conduit in the ground and run some ethernet cable through there. But I don't have a lawn, I've got a cement driveway and I'm not about to go dig up part of my cement driveway to get ethernet out here. So my last option was this. And I was a little hesitant, but it works really, really well. It's called a point to point bridge. This one's made by Ubiquity. I bought them for like 50 or 80 bucks. They're really, really cheap. And basically what it is, is a wireless ethernet cable. I have one on my house. I have one here. They're powered over ethernet, which is awesome. You point them at each other, you open an app and you say, now kiss. And they just extend the network. The great thing is this is an ethernet cable. So I can plug this into a switch inside my garage. I can run additional wireless access points. I can plug stuff in over ethernet and they don't think they're on a different network because they aren't. It is a wireless ethernet cable. I mean, that's, that's really all there is to it. They work really, really great. The problem is, well, this one isn't really plugged into anything right now. I need to mount my switch on the wall and actually get Wi-Fi into the garage. Here I have my switch. Now for a piece of enterprise equipment, this is actually pretty attractive, but by the time I have a bunch of ethernet cables and power coming out of here, it's gonna be a little bit unsightly. So I bought this enclosure that I'm going to put on the wall. Now you might be thinking, well, that doesn't look much better. And you're right, but do you know what? That's just the way things are sometimes because this is the only insulated and climate controlled room in the garage. I install this mini split, so this will be a nice temperature, but the rest of the garage gets really, really hot in the summer and really cold in the winter. This switch has been sitting for the last couple months to provide Wi-Fi to our garage in the attic above this room. It's been north of 130 degrees up there, which is really bad for computers and networking equipment. In fact, it's been so hot that the LCD display on this little thing has been almost entirely damaged just because of heat exposure. So I have to put this in this room if I want it to last any more than a year. Hey, now that this networking cable is installed, I'm ready to install the outlet. This is 12 gauge Romex. I put a 20 amp uh, outlet on here and uh, we're ready to mount the rack. All right, this is my 2U switch rack. Now, the thing about uh, walls and construction is that uh, even when you don't do it yourself, it's hard to get things level. When you do it yourself, it's harder to get things level. <laughs>
and it's mounted. The switch is in its place, this thing isn't going anywhere, and I would be tempted to just take the beautiful cover and plop it on. But uh, you see, I can't do that yet because, well, first of all, I have to terminate all of these ethernet cables. If you haven't seen my uh, home retrofit video, definitely check that out because I have a couple tips and tricks that people don't tell you on how to terminate cables. But once that's done with the help of movie magic, we only have left to do, well, the other ends of these cables, specifically our camera, our access point, and of course, the TV. All right, so with a little bit of uh, jerry-rigging, we now have the rack on the wall. And, uh, well, I'm definitely going to need to uh, buy some right-angle power plugs because uh, they look real sad and the rack is not all the way against the wall. But check this out. If I take a picture of the screen with my iPhone, you will see that, hey, 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 we've got a one gigabits per second link back to the house. So our point-to-point -point bridge is working, but we have no Wi-Fi out here yet because this is just a switch. So it's access point time. Speaking of access points, I am using the Unify Nano HD. Uh, these things are uh, pretty great. This is not a Wi-Fi 6 model, which is now available, by the way. So these are just the uh, AC versions, but I'm not too worried about it because my point-to-point -point bridge from my house to the garage can really only carry about five, 600 megabits per second peak anyways. Okay, so we're gonna put it in the corner of the room because uh, this will, such a small room, it's gonna provide more than ample Wi-Fi coverage to the entire garage, but also because I want to make sure that we don't interfere with the surround sound speakers that we're going to be doing in a minute. So we're gonna put it kind of in the corner, out of the way, and uh, we're gonna make some marks on the ceiling so that we can install our uh, drywall screws. Measure once, drill once. And these are garbage. Ubiquity says to put a 25 millimeter hole in the drywall for the cable. 25 millimeters is an inch. That's massive. These connectors are like almost exactly a half inch. So I think with a half inch, with a little bit of a, you know, wang jangling, we're gonna be in business. Okay, cable incoming. Oh wait, whoops, wrong hole. Cable incoming. Ha, I don't know if a half inch will be enough, he said. There's miles of room. All right, I haven't tested this cable's continuity, so hopefully it's wired right. But we're gonna take our PoE cable, stick it into the access point. Oh, we gotta remove this little, Cover, stick it into the access point. Actually, I don't think you have to do that, but whatever. And then, give me a light, baby. Give me a sign. Give, oh yeah, it's glowing. And check it out. New UAP Nano HD fan. So we just push set up and it's connecting. I'll give it a name. We'll call this Garage AP. Finish. That's so easy. This is a camera. Why put a camera in here? Well, I want to check out my wife, but also I want to make sure that, uh, you know, nothing in this gym gets stolen. Uh, this is the G3 Flex. It's an $80 camera, and it's built into the Unify Ubiquity suite of products. What's cool about it is you can store all of your recordings locally without sending them to the cloud. And then what I also really like about them is they have Homebridge support built in. So I can get them inside of the Apple HomeKit app. When events happen, motion alerts, I get sent right on my phone, really handy. This requires a one and one eighth inch hole, or excuse me, two and one eighth inch hole. I got a two and a quarter uh, hole saw. This will be fine. So I'm just gonna go right uh, there probably. What are they called? Safety device. <laughs> they sound stupid. So what you gotta do is climb on the studs without falling through and killing yourself and ruining your ceiling. Oh, this freaking sucks. The coolest thing about this, other than my entire body being supported by the weight of uh, uh, 
three two by fours um, is that uh, if I move my head up at all, I'm going to impale myself with roofing nails. All right, stick the camera through the hole, please. Beautiful. Keep holding it. Okay, hold on. We have a problem. Well, I'm a dumb dumb. Uh-oh. <laughs> I have a problem, but I don't want to deal with it. Tool, please. Megan, it's, it's not worth living anymore. Wasn't that easy? Well, that install made me lose more calories and self-confidence than a gym could ever achieve. But I've got it done. Now, it's upside down and the video sucks, but that's easy. That's fixable. That's software. Just when you thought, surely this guy must not be putting any more holes in his wall. <laughs> You're wrong, it's the ceiling, and yes I am. Because I have here a surround sound system that is in ceiling from Sonance. Uh, I bought this, basically none of this video is sponsored, this is all my gear. Um, why did I buy this? Well, it was slightly affordable from Best Buy, but it's supposed to sound really, really, really good for the money. It is a 5.1 channel surround system uh, available for about $6.99, which is not inexpensive, make no mistake. But um, for the number of channels and the alleged quality, uh, it's supposed to be quite good. Sonance is actually the company that makes uh, Sonos's fancy, architectural, bougie, very expensive speakers. And I've been told that they basically sound pretty much the same. And you get five of these for basically the same price as Sonos's two. So, and here they are. Wow, they are pretty large. So hopefully we have room for them. So here you can see the driver assembly. We've got our big old magnet here at the back. We've got our binding posts for our speaker wire, which is luckily already in the ceiling. This is pre-wired. And then we've got these paintable magnetic covers, but they come white, which coincidentally is the color of our ceiling. So I don't think I'm going to be painting anything. Here you go. You can see there is a mid-range uh, woofer in the back, and then you've got two tweeters that are downwards firing. Uh, cool. This is going to be easy. After this, it's pretty easy. I've got my speaker wire already in the ceiling. I did that when I did electrical. And I just have to take my wire stripper and take the jacket off of the wire, give it enough length that it can make contact with the binding posts on the speaker. And uh, Bob's your uncle. So let's just spin this for good measure. Spin this for good measure and check this out. I got the copper on the red. These spring-loaded binding posts are super handy. You don't have to screw anything in. You just jam it in there and you're done. I just simply, oh, by the way, these have a thing called old work tabs. When you have a screwdriver and you spin them, they're little dog legs that grab your sheetrock and so that it doesn't fall through and then you just tighten them to fit and that's all there is to it. Now that we've got the speakers in the ceiling, we need a TV. This is uh, an older TV that I've had for a while. This is a 2019 uh, LG NanoCell 65 inch TV. Uh, when it was new, it was about $1,300. And uh, I was always impressed with the video quality and the, you know, the display for how inexpensive of a 65 inch TV it was. Um, you can get these now for six, 700 bucks on the secondhand market. And I think they're value kings at that price point. Um, you do get backlight bleed. I mean, this is not like a high-end OLED, but for this purpose, it's great. And I already have it, which is great. Uh, I'm gonna wall mount it. And yes, 
I am a follower of the subreddit TV Too High. I am going to be putting the TV too high because I'm not going to be sitting on a sofa back here. We're going to be standing. This is a gym. My wife and I are both tall. She's six foot. I'm six four. And we'll also be sitting on top of spin bikes and other tall equipment. So we want the TV, well, at our eye level, which is pretty high. So the TV will be too high. This is my center line here in the room. And if I put the template dead center, uh, I don't quite hit my stud. This is a brick veneer. Now it's a real brick. It uh, has mortar and grout uh, and a bunch of adhesive. So it's actually pretty strong, but it is still sitting on top of drywall. Um, I've heard that the strength of these walls is better than your standard drywall wall, but I want to be sure and hit a wood stud behind everything just in case. Because of my electrical boxes, I know a stud is here. I have studs that are 24 inches on center, so I can probably only hit one of them. Uh, if I shift this template, uh-oh, the TV is no longer centered, except for it still can be because these brackets and most TV brackets have a little bit of tolerance. So you can slide them if you need to have the bracket off center. So prioritize studs, and then you can worry about actually centering the TV on the wall later. There's only one thing I feel worse about than my body in the last year, not being able to play VR. <laughs> I am a huge virtual reality enthusiast. And well, we moved into this house, it's too small for a dedicated VR space. And so my Valve Index has just been collecting dust. I miss it, I wanna get back to it. And that's part of the reason why I built that gym. The problem is, is that my previous PC was both very large and didn't quite have the power to run the Valve Index at the frame rate that I was seeking, no longer. This is a crazy tiny case uh, from SSUPD. They're a sister brand of Lee and Lee. It's called the Meshalicious. And this thing is probably the nicest uh, PC case I've ever seen before, including ones that uh, cost more money. And holy crap, <laughs> does this thing cost a lot of money. Uh, but it looks fantastic. It's all mesh, which is cool because that theoretically means airflow will be pretty good. And I can jam it full of fairly powerful components, which I'm going to do starting with the Ryzen 5600X. Okay, so this isn't the top of the line CPU, but it's more than sufficient for VR gaming, which actually benefits quite a lot from multi-core performance. So a six core 12 thread processor, gonna be nice. But more importantly, on the graphics front, I have right here the Radeon Pro 69, nice, 6900 XTOC. This is the uh, ASRock uh, edition AIB card. And holy crap, <laughs> is this thing like, gigantic. This is a three slot card that is absolutely ginormous. It's larger and longer than I think any other graphics card I've ever seen. And look at this, it has three eight pin powered headers. Are you kidding me? but it still fits in this tiny little case. And part of that is thanks to this very tiny uh, SFX uh, 850 watt power supply from Therm uh, excuse me, Cooler Master. I bought this on Amazon. I was a little nervous because there's about 500 reviews that say they all blow up and they're bad and they suck and the fan speed is really high. Well, apparently they've just fixed that a couple months ago. These new ones are supposed to be way better. Um, it's only uh, gold certified. You're not gonna get long 80 plus platinum, but who cares? It's in a tiny little build and I think it's going to perform very well, but it provides the power that I need to run this BV card. Uh, what else? Well, we've got a basic uh, Aorus Pro ITX motherboard. We've got uh, 32 gigs of Corsair uh, DDR4 memory. This is 3600, I think. Thir yep, 3600 megahertz. And then we also have a one terabyte Samsung 980 Pro SSD, which is nice because PCIe 4. On the cooling side, uh, we're just using an old Corsair AIO cooler that I have laying around. And that's because I'm going to lay the thing on its side. One of the sides, because there's a motherboard side and a graphics side, is going to have to be starved of air. And well, definitely can't be the GPU. So we're gonna put the GPU on top with the rad on the front. I think that will uh, cool the CPU adequately and then we can leave the motherboard turned upside down inside the cupboard.
Okay, my in-ceiling speakers are installed and they look fantastic, but they sound, well, I don't know how they sound because I haven't had a way to power them yet until today. This is the Denon AVR S750H. I bought this for a couple of reasons. Number one, it was $150 off at Costco, which I'll admit was a pretty big incentive, but also because this is one of few receivers that has both AirPlay 2 support, which is fantastic because we can beam stuff from our phone and when we're using the light boxer from our iPad, but it also has Bluetooth. The tonal right here, which we're gonna do a lot of our workouts on, uh, allows you to use Bluetooth headphones or speakers because the built-in speakers are just frankly not very good. And this is a much better alternative. So we're gonna plug this puppy in, go through the on-screen setup, and then there's a little weird thing I wanna show you. So as you can probably tell, this room is not sound treated. Most rooms are not professionally sound treated. And a lot of new receivers will come with one of these. This is a calibration microphone. And Sonos does it with uh, actual smartphones. Uh, this you know, is, is a little tripod microphone thing that does the same thing. But basically you put this where you will be sitting and the capsule is pointing upward and it measures the reflections off of the wall and the delay in between the signal coming to your ear and being transmitted. And it tries to create a sound profile for the room in the position that you're going to be listening to accommodate for the fact that, well, this is not really a sound treated room. Uh, these are really, really cool and uh, they actually work better than you would expect. So we're going to go ahead, put this on a tripod and do the calibration. That's my brother and sister's band. Go check them out, Silver Cup. They're available everywhere. Um, they sound pretty good. I have some additional EQing to do. I kind of lied to you, the subwoofer's not plugged in and that's massively hurting the low end. But I think with a little EQ, these will sound really, really awesome. And this is a gym, so I'm not super picky. Let's talk desktop VR. Now, things have changed a lot in the last couple of years because Oculus got out of the desktop VR game. You can kind of use the Oculus Quest linked to your PC with a cable and it does work fairly well. But if you really want true desktop VR, I'm kind of a snob and you need Steam VR. Now these use what are called lighthouses and they're basically, uh, there's a motor inside here that spins a laser around a bunch of times per second. And he uses what's called outside in tracking. So whereas an Oculus Quest has sensors on the actual headset itself to determine where your controllers are, this is the opposite where this shoots laser beams all over the room and then your headset based on the beams that it sees determines where it's located inside of the space. It's a really cool technology. It's a lot more expensive. It's somewhat more difficult to set up. You have to mount these physically to your walls so you can't just leave the room and do VR wherever you want. It's more of a process, but ultimately you get much higher precision, especially in your hands, which is a huge game breaking experience when you're trying to move your hands and they, they're a little jittery or they're not quite moving in the right space. It messes with your brain and it's immersion breaking. The second thing is Oculus doesn't really know what happens once you're out of view of the sensors because they're located on your face. And so for example, when you're pulling back the quiver on a bow, um, once you go behind your head, Oculus doesn't really know where your hand is and they have to guess. Now, based on the game you're doing, they, they do a pretty good job of guessing, but it's still guessing. And so you don't have the precision of this where literally you can move your hands in inhuman ways and it still stays available in the game. Are you recording? Uh -huh. Oh, uh, yeah, so it's not perfect, but I think it's pretty good. Not just the VR thing, the whole gym. I'm excited about the gear that we're going to be using here, and you should be too, because this is just part one of two. This is setting part of it up. But you're gonna see what it's like to be in a smart home gym coming up soon, from the gear to the automation and more. Be sure to get subscribed for that one. If you enjoyed this video, well, go to like. If you didn't, fine. <laughs> Hit the downvote button. But thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay snazzy.